Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango, dot org. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peace Phonicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network on TheConsciousResistance.com and The Seeds of Liberty. Dot com. So peaceful anarchism is covered by the BIPCOT no-gov license. This allows reuse by anyone except for governments and the agents thereof. You can find out more information for this at BIPCOT.org. So today we are pleased to have Tyler Bloyer coming in from Utah. He's, the, he's a peaceful parent, father, and truth seeker. He's the host of Liberty Lifestyle Podcast and the founder of Salt Lake Freedom Hive. And you can find his work on tylerbloyer.com. Links uh, will be in the description. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, his path to volunteerism, what has influenced him along the way, and uh, what is Liberty Lifestyle, what is the Salt Lake Freedom Hive, and perhaps his approach to peaceful parenting. Um, it's always cool to talk to uh, more and more peaceful parents because I think uh, that is the foundation we're truly disseminating this philosophy, you know, when we create the next generation of, of uh, logical, rational, kind, compassionate, loving human beings. There's nothing that can replace that. So, <laughs> so Tyler, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Absolutely. I appreciate you having me on, Danilo. And uh, I appreciate you appearing on the Liberty Lifestyle podcast for my second episode of that new project. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on. There's a reason why you're one of the first people I reached out to. It's because I have been influenced by by your words and your work and like we were talking about earlier even your 10 minute little brief videos that you put out i i love those personally i think they're they're great and you you clearly state what you're trying to say there um and yeah i i I like being on the peaceful anarchism uh podcast i appreciate you having me on sure no problem yeah i uh yeah i've been putting those out since last year in uh, a couple months now almost coming up on a year and it's really enjoyable you know it's like i i pick out certain things in life that get me thinking and i i just kind of extrapolate on that and, and some people some of my close friends are like are you sure you're not reading from a script i'm like no not really. <laughs> The, the, the words just come to me, you know, and and of course, being outside in nature is even more inspirational. Uh, so it kind of sucks when the weather's bad and I'm forced to be in my uh, my ba- in my house or in my basement. So, uh, but yeah, those are really fun to do. Um, <clears throat> so, so yeah, please um, let's talk a little bit about uh, before we get into what you're doing now, uh, how you came to volunteerism, your path, uh, and uh, and then we'll get into later your influences and and uh, uh, you know what what YouTube channels and authors or other podcasts influence you along the way? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, voluntarism for me, or anarchism, or peaceful parenting, um, unschooling even, to me, these are are terms that we kind of have to use to publicly address um, the issues that we're we're trying to address. And I personally don't like labels. I'm one of those types. I don't love labels. I kind of try to stay away from labeling um, myself, because what I, I see the human uh, species as, or, or all beings really, and um, myself is, you know, a, a being with infinite potential who has uh, the ability to create and do whatever they like, and 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 that result is inf- infinite. You can really kind of create whatever you can imagine, and um, voluntarism, anarchism, like I said, are ways for me to reach out to my public circle, to my immediate immediate sphere of influence, and talk about things and concepts and philosophy to boil it down to, to and that's where the label comes in, to something that you can categorize that at and, and define. And so for me, I, don't, I can't really ever say that I wasn't a voluntarist, right, or that I wasn't an anarchist. I don't think I ever meant to use violence against other people on purpose. I don't think there was ever a point in my life when I didn't want uh, my relationships with other human beings to be completely voluntary. 
Um, now, I think a lot of us get led down a path that will eventually lead to us making decisions that cause harm to other people, and sometimes knowingly, but a lot of the time unknowingly, and that could be through willful ignorance or through a certain nescience, um, information that wasn't available to you so you didn't know that your actions were causing harm to other people. Um, you know, so as far as a path to that, um, I could say that there was a path to indoctrination and mind control that I was put into and subjected to as a child um, and throughout my young adult life. Um, and, and heavy, like you said, I'm from Utah. I was born and raised in Farmington, Utah as a, in the LDS church. I went to public schools. So I got the, the full spoonful. You know, I got, I got the full um, program what I would consider uh, the program refined as it is at this point of indoctrination, of, of communist indoctrination, socialist indoctrination, and then the religious um, aspect to that as well, which I don't know if we'll go into that too much here tonight, but it, it's also a system of control and definitely mind control. Um, it can be used to hold beings back from recognizing their, their full potential. Um, not that it can't be used for good things, not that um, certain uh, faiths or not all religion is bad, but specifically organized religions that are organized belief systems. Um, things that require you to accept without um, using critical thinking, to accept the, the words and the statements without using a process of critical thinking. Well, that's indoctrination. Indoctrination is beliefs that you hold that were accepted unchallenged. And so that came at me pretty heavy as a child, and I didn't really fall for it necessarily, I would say. I didn't fully dive in to that world. I kind of sensed that something wasn't right pretty early, I would say, um, in early grade school. And I did what I call a checkout. I kind of went through the motions of school and even the church and uh, watch, really observed the adults around me and the contradictions in their behavior to what they were saying. And like I said, I called it kind of a check. I just coasted through that period and, and knew that I didn't really want to fully dive in and climb the ladder and be one of those in, in public school or, or in even private schools that you see that just jumps in and just starts climbing the ladder really fast. And they want to get all the A's and accelerate the best they can. And not that those are negative qualities, but it can be if you're doing it for the wrong reasons and if the, if the system that you're doing that in is not meant to serve you ultimately in the end, then it's actually quite foolish to give it your full attention and, and, and energy. And, and I didn't know all this as a, as a younger child. I think that it was just maybe a, maybe an intuition you could call it, or like I described it, just kind of checked out. And that happened all the way up until, you know, when I was 14, I left the Mormon church. I, my mother luckily questioned uh, the, the religion, and that was a big example for me, uh, somebody really close to me, my mother, um, saying that, hey, I've, I've done it. She brought me aside and said, hey, I've done a lot of research. I've looked into this. I've had some questions, and I don't agree with this anymore, and I'm not, not going to you know, be a part of that. And that, I think, was a big catalyst for me to say, oh, wow, you can do that. You, know, you can, <laughs> you can mm. decide to take something that's been a part of you your whole life and just, and just change it um, by doing research. You know, that was an example of somebody who didn't just take the um, the dogma unchallenged and just accepted it and, and, and didn't. And also, I mean, for her, that was a huge uh, mental thing to get out of because you have your whole peers, your her parents were still, you know, um, in that religion. Uh, the community around us, we were in a really Mormon area. So... You know, she she was facing loss of community, loss of friends, loss of family, loss of self. Mm -hmm. um, you know what you feel like is yourself, and so like I said, I think that a few years later, I did the, I followed suit. You know, I said, well, hey, I I haven't felt right about this the whole time, so why am I going to continue to to do something that I don't agree with? And um, but then you know that imbalance as a child led into an imbalance after that of extreme, you know, the, the extreme opposite of that kind of thing is to go seek out 
you know, what I did was was kind of no belief systems, almost to the point, well, really to the point of like an atheistic, almost like solipsistic worldview. And so in that period, I call my unconscious state. So then I went through a period of, of just kind of like saying nothing's real then, and there is no, you know, reality that makes sense. Each person kind of is in their own reality. Hey, and I can do whatever I want. I can go and have as much fun as I want without consequence. Mm -hmm. And as long as I'm getting away with it, you know, whatever it, whatever it is, um, for me, it was just more, more or less having a good time with my friends. Um, but I, I would say we were pretty wild. Uh, I went into a period of thinking that there was no real more moral consequence even for your actions, you know? And, uh, Needless to say, I, I learned the hard way that that's not true. And I came back around um, and through a series of events beyond that and a series of people that I can't fully take credit for all this happening. I mean, a lot of this stuff that we'll talk about here tonight, um, it's not like I came up with it or I'm responsible for having this great awakening or something like that. Um, I have to give credit to the people around me that that saw maybe I was questioning a little bit or that I had uh, uh, some um, lack of of knowledge that they thought they could pass along at that time. And that's really kind of what happened. Just this random set of events where the right person at the right time tried to hand me something and I took it and I looked into it and I watched that documentary. I read that book or I, I looked into the Federal Reserve or, hey, I looked into the whole... Um, Social Security makes you a corporation, legal fiction thing. And, uh, you know, the legal land rabbit hole, I consider it kind of a waste of time, but ultimately you're free. And uh, don't let anybody ever write anything down on paper that says otherwise. That's kind of how I feel about the legal system. But some people need to learn a lot about that to challenge uh, jurisdiction and uh, they get caught up in the in the legal system. But... Um, Besides that, uh, like I said, there was a series of events that happened after that where people brought to me the Thrive movie or people would, would get me looking into 9-11. And I also started addressing my health. So an interesting part of, of my kind of journey to starting to understand the principles of voluntarism or, or all that was really kind of twofold. One, I started to address my health and stop drinking tap water. So if anyone out there is drinking the fluoridated tap water, try quitting for a month and switch to spring water and just see how you feel. And for me, I was like, wow, like if that if I can change that much just from that little thing, what is going on here? You know, what is the deal? And and that really was one of the things that got me really questioning what I was have been told up to this point about um, you know, those who say that they are are watching out for our best interests, serving and protecting, um, if that's really true, because I, I remembered decades before that hearing the argument and debate about fluoride being in the water, and my my reaction was, why don't they just let people put in their water whatever they want, you know? And then I kind of let it go, and then years later, realized that it was a lot bigger deal than that, and um, then. You know, you, you start to see with real eyes, with your with your open eyes, what's really going on around you, how the control system works, how how the education system really works, how the monetary system really works. Um, and I and I went down those those corridors and I looked into those those facets of our reality and had the freak out period too of of oh oh look at out there, oh they're oh they're doing this, oh they're doing that, oh can you see that? Oh there's this and a lot of years of, of doing, of doing that, I can know? I can definitely relate to that. <laughs> and but then, but then I asked why, why, why is it that this is going on, and I'm only coming to scratch the surface level of some of these things. Um, but then I look around, and it seems like the other people don't want to know. They don't care. They don't. They're not interested. Uh, they they want to label me as as crazy, a conspiracy theorist, just some nut job, tinfoil hat guy in his mm-hmm. mom's basement, or something like that, right? <laughs> I'm sure you can sympathize with a little bit of that too when you when you try to discuss even just something as simple as the economic system. People, oh, that sounds. Uh, what do you mean, private banking system? Mm-hmm. Uh, 
a cartel that's been running the world for thousands of years who <laughs> you know <laughs> uses drug money to to start wars and all this stuff you know mm. um so why was my question why is it that I can see these people who seemingly care. They say they want to be free. They say they want to be happy. They say they want prosperity for themselves and their family. But yet when it comes to looking into the information that would be required to understand to get those things, they don't want anything to do with it whatsoever. They want nothing to do with that information at all. And, you know, again, well, why? You know, <laughs> is my question. Why, why is this? How come I can see this clearly with my eyes, you know, and I can show the guy next to me the same thing and he has a completely different reaction and his mind shuts it down, turns it, you know, can't be this, it can't be what you're saying, it's definitely not what you're, what, anything that's cons conspiratorial, it's, it's not, it's not anything that was in that big of an agenda or anything like that, there's not some secret shadow government you know, pulling off uh, false flags or PSYOP operations to control the public, um, where I was like, really? Because it's pretty clear, like, <laughs> that's mm -hmm. what I'm seeing, you know, and that, and it's not just me, look, here's the information, you know, and, and I came to find that it's not the information, you can't, it's not about giving people the information, um, it's not about getting them to see the stuff that you saw, or even the researchers that you've researched, or um, it's way more than that. And so again, why was my question? Why is this, you know? And at this point I hadn't re found voluntarism. I hadn't found the philosophy of anarchism, but I did want to know why. And that led me down a series of teachers and books and YouTubes and documentaries. And honestly, I'm, I'm kind of more the millennial age where I've gotten a lot of this information from people doing podcasts, from people doing um, YouTube. Uh, reading books is difficult for me, I'll admit, but I still do listen to a lot of audiobooks, and I still do read, you know, some of the greats um, right on their books, like Nietzsche or Hegel, um, different philosophers that, that, that their books are kind of hard to find. I kind of like collecting stuff like that, mm. but... Uh, what I came to find through all that was was the ultimate end why, and and this would take probably another like two hour presentation to really explain or to get people to see why I came to this conclusion was that people are kind of in a condition of of self loathing that they ultimately in the end don't actually love themselves, which is kind of it's sad to say and hard to admit, but I had to admit it myself personally that I was not shown what real, you know, love was and, and didn't wasn't able to love myself because of that. And that the conditions that we are in as a whole in society are ultimately caused by by self loathing due to trauma and parental abandonment issues. Um, not just physical abandonment either, but mental abandonment or um, physical abuse even can, can cause a, a schism in the child to not want to be uh, close to their parent. Mm. Um, but so parenting, so a lot, a lot of it with, with what you do on your show or, or stuff that I've talked about on the Liberty Lifestyle already, we, we, we focus on parenting because we see it as such a huge solution to the problems that we're facing in the world. Well, why do we see that? Well, the reason why is because um, there's a cyclical thing happening on this planet right now in, in family relationships there's a cycle that's continuing and it doesn't have to be like i said just physical abuse there's a there's a form of mental abuse and mental abandonment that can be uh, put on a child to continue the cycle and, and if you didn't heal from this throughout your lifetime and then went and had kids then you're most likely going to continue that cycle so uh, that, and that's happening on a massive scale you know and most people aren't going to admit that to your face but Ultimately, deep down inside, there's a form of, of self-loathing going on there to cause the cycle to continue because no one would support external government over themselves. No one would support violence against other people. No one would really just turn a blind eye to these wars going on, to the, to the terrorism that our own government does to its own people. Um, those things would not be occurring with a, a human species that 
the overwhelming majority of people truly loved themselves and truly uh, saw themselves as sovereign beings who who wouldn't tolerate that sort of a thing. So you can say that I'm wrong, you can say it's not true, that the vast overwhelming majority of people do love themselves, and what's this guy talking about? <laughs> he, he can't be right. But when you look out at the external conditions and you really study it, you, you can't, um, there's no way you could deny that. And, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, I know I'm kind of going on, but... That's right. So, so, so then... So after all this, you know, I'm, I'm going down this kind of this little bit of a rabbit hole, or, or breaking out of the matrix, or whatever, and seeing seeing things for what I consider to be more along the lines of what they actually are. Um, and then I came to find certain people like Larkin Rose came up into into my radar, right? And I'm hearing Larkin Rose on the Peace Revolution podcast, and it's Richard Grove's podcast, one of one of the best out there, I think. Um, for recontextualizing history, as he calls it, which mm. really helps you break down these questions I had of why. Mm. Um, it, it got, um, it, it really helped, um, like he like he says, recontextualize what I had been completely, you know, given the wrong story, and then to go back and see kind of how this um, came about, how this whole control system comes about, but never forgetting that that first part that it's because. Of the of of what's going on inside people, that's why we're getting this outside reflection of of what we're seeing, and we can never forget that that it's not it's not just them, it's not just out there, it's not just the Illuminati, it's not just the the Rothschilds, it's not just the Queen, it's not just any of these skull and bones, the, the Freemasons, it's not just that. It's they're only doing what they're doing because most people are asking for it they're begging for it mm -hmm. they're demanding it in a way and and it's because of this internal um, problem that that people have they're not doing the work in here they're reproducing raising families in this same mindset of self-loathing behavior that just takes tyranny that just takes slavery and doesn't do anything about it those are self-loathing individuals and um, never forgetting that, but then hearing a Larkin Rose come in, and I'm like, who's this guy? <laughs> what is he talking about? You know, Richard brought him on the show with this lawyer, and they were having a little debate about statism versus, versus anarchism, and I remember specifically, I was on the lawyer's side for like half of the argument. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, this guy, what is he talking about? <laughs> you know, but Larkin, you know, Larkin has a way of, of addressing um, statism, and putting it in a way that makes sense, hmm. and and I, I remember that very specifically. Having I was in the shower, even listening to the podcast, you know, I remember it. <laughs> and um, then shortly after that, Richard brought on Mark Passio to, and you know, people out there may not like Mark Passio or, or his work or his angle or his style, but as far as natural law and anarchism and these things. He's also very good at explaining it in a way that makes sense, in a way that really can't be refuted. And then you suddenly say, well, that's what I am. I'm an anarchist, right? Because all anarchism means, or all anarchy means, is without rulers, without masters. So, an, from the Greek prefix, without, an, an uh, archon, or, um, yeah, archon is master right a ruler so an archon or anarchy is without rulers without masters and without slaves so no masters above no slaves below mm. um and i so okay well that's what i am i don't want a master i don't want anybody to rule over me and i don't have any intention to rule over anybody else so i'm an internal monarchy with you know or an internal uh Monarch. I have one ruler at home, but external anarchy. I don't desire to have anyone rule over me, and I don't desire to rule over anyone else. So that makes sense to me. I don't need to wear the T-shirt. I don't need to, you know, uh, tell everybody that they need to be an anarchist. But it, to me, anarchism means reality. Hmm. To me, it's the, it's the same as truth. To say anarchy is to say the truth that which is it's our it's reality right so what do you think about that 
Awesome. You touched on so many points. <laughs> um, let's see. What was some of the uh, my favorites was how you were saying that um, most people consider themselves to be moral agents. Um, you know, good, decent people, right? Most people um, consider themselves knowledgeable on what is right and wrong. And, and, you know, when we talk about, you know, when I tell somebody, yeah, I talk about morality, like, yeah, I know morality. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the problem is that, of course, they have this giant exception to morality called the state. And um, our job is to explain that, no, there is no exception to morality. No, no badge, no costume, um, no position, um, nothing can exempt someone from the laws of morality. It's equally immoral um, to rob someone here or rob someone an ocean away, right? And so that's one thing that we have to help people to understand. Uh, and, and, and of course, advocating for the state is um, supporting immorality in, the, in, you know, in its essence. So uh, that's, that's one thing. That's very important. And what was the other thing? The, the one you said, uh, the the one uh, you said, you did say a good point, right? Right, right before you stopped, you said, um, what were you talking about? Uh, just anarchy and just the, you know, the, the definition of the word specifically is why I agree with, with that philosophy. I, I don't necessarily, you know, there's ANCOMs out there too, right? Yeah. You got that ANCOM uh, Antifa crowd, right? <laughs> right, right. And so, you, 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 know. you know, the idea of... Um, I, I don't know if I heard it from you first or I, it was someone else maybe, I don't know. But the idea of an internal monarch and external anarchy, that's an interesting idea. <laughs> I never right. really thought of it like that. Well, that's the but thing. You need to have you need to have rulership over yourself. Over your self-governance, you know? right? And if you don't, right. Right. If, if you don't rule yourself, then you'll automatically be defaulted to have external right. governance, right? This exactly. is a conversation me and my son are having constantly, right? Nice. <laughs> um, you're not my boss. Well, you're right. But if you can then behave properly and not... Um, need to be told what to do then i then i won't tell you what to do right but it but if you're just gonna let crackers exist all over the floor in your room for <laughs> weeks then eventually i've got to say something you know but if you would just clean it up yeah and you controlled that situation then yeah you don't need a boss at that point right. it's the same with human beings if we are really raised all the way up to be adults and act like an adult which we don't have right now we the vast overwhelming majority of people are in a a childlike state of extended adolescence brought on by this system, but mm. then also maintained by their willful ignorance. I mean, I I don't give people exception. I don't just say it's it's the control grid, it's the mind control, it's the fluoride, it's the Prozac, it's all the SSRIs, it's the chemtrails, it's the food. Oh, you know, hey, we have to have it this way. No, we don't. We don't have to be in these conditions, and it's simply. Uh, the choice of those people to want to remain in that condition that that keeps things the way they are. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then and the other thing you said was um, about you know the um, the central bankers and the Rothschilds and the Freemasons and Illuminati and all that. Um, and and yeah, it's it's kind of interesting when people focus on that because um, I don't think that's even that important at all anymore. Because really, for me, the ultimate question is. What, where is the origin of power? How are these people so powerful, right? And the way I see it is the vast majority of people who believe them to be legitimate give them power, right? And, you know, just like um, in the Game of Thrones, you know, I think um, uh, the, the guy was telling, uh, was it, uh, uh, what's the short guy in the Game of Thrones? I forget his name. Oh. <laughs> uh. I know who you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, the one the, the wise man says. You know, when it comes to power, um, a short, uh, a small man can cast a very large shadow, right? Because it's not it's not really about you know it's not really about strength. It's not about being able to be you know being able to personally kill people. No, it's about people legitimately believing you are their rightful ruler. And if you can be, if you can have people believe that, you have great power. And and you know talking about your uh, government schooling, what is the origin of that belief? Is it, first of all, it's parenting, right? Being raised by your parents to believe that that's legitimate, and then schooling just enforces that even more powerfully, right? 15,000 hours of, of harsh indoctrination. And, and it definitely is indoctrination since, um, you know, it's like, it's 
like uh, you want you want to figure out what the agenda is for something you know figure out who's funding it right uh, i think i mentioned this on on, on your <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> right if you you got uh yeah coca-cola funding the schools what do you think they're gonna what do you think they're gonna promote right. <laughs> so so you yeah. know it's a government school so what do you think they're gonna promote so yeah it's, it just only makes sense um and and it's really it's really great i love hearing people's um journey to volunteerism because it's like you know and, and that's amazing about your your mother you know she um made that decision to separate herself from that community even though it came at great cost of uh, maybe friendships and um you know close bonds with other people that she's probably developed over years but in the end um it it, it tells me that what she values is um, being logically consistent and her principles and being true to herself, right? And and it, she doesn't just value the community for community's sake. It's right. It's all about you know being being logical and being consistent. And um and it and it reminds me of a um a quote I love to to use by Emiliano Emiliano Zapata, a Mexican revolutionary, right? Which says, uh, um, "I will die a slave of principles, not of men." Yep. <laughs> and I, love I love that. that. <laughs> I love that quote. You you said that recently on another one of your shows, oh, and I, I went and I, f I found a meme and I put it on some of my pages that said that guy. You know, and I looked into his history a little bit, uh -huh. and it's pretty interesting that he had some anarchist influences around him. Uh -huh. I don't I don't think he was like a completely non statist guy, but very rebellious against the right. oppression of his people and and saw. A lot more of the problem that, than most. Awesome, and and I really like that quote too that, that you had brought up. Yeah, it's a good one. Oh, because yeah. it's true. I mean, and and that's where we should put principles first. Yeah. Those are first things. A principle is the first thing, right? So if you don't put first things first, you know, and and like he said, you, if you allow yourself to be a slave of men, then then yeah, you'll die a slave of men. But he was saying, you know, I'll put my principles before that and if that kills me at least i'll die a slave of those things and not you know a slave of other men dying at their hands right uh, i really do think that was a powerful quote it brings a lot more up into it than people really look into i think but yeah yeah and it's and, and it again speaks it speaks to self-governance and uh you know choosing that you you must um be the number one ruler of yourself you, you know in terms of self-ownership and taking responsibility for your actions and the, and the consequences of your actions and uh, so yeah very empowering um so please um yeah get into your um uh, liberty lifestyle and um and uh, and then the uh, the salt lake freedom hive and, and what those are about yeah so liberty lifestyle uh thanks for bringing that up it was a it's a podcast that i recently started um got the first episode out in april of 2017 and started right here in utah with with somebody Skylar Collins, who's been a, a big influence of mine, um, especially with the parenting stuff and uh, the peaceful parenting and the unschooling, and, and really kind of brought a lot of that to my mind. I, I, I went to his site, everythingvoluntary.com, um, when I was looking into those things, because it comes up kind of first when you search some of those keywords, kind of found him, hey, this guy's from Utah, hey, this guy's mm -hmm. kind of like me, I can, I can kind of see myself getting along with this guy, and then you know, started communicating with him and, and did an interview uh, before the Liberty Lifestyle podcast was even conceived. And then just said, hey, why not turn this thing into a podcast and I'll bring on a lot of the people that have influenced me um, and that are living their principles, you know, principles first. And these people are out there actually doing the behavior, not just talking about it. I want to bring them on. I want to talk to them. I want to show my immediate circle of influence and maybe a larger audience, hopefully, um, you know, why I feel the way I feel, why I say the things I say, why I'm against statism, you know, and, and bring a longer dialogue out for myself to, to enjoy it myself. You and I were talking about that earlier. It, it, for me, it's, it's, a, it's a passion of mine to uh, work with audio, video files and the internet and produce digital content, um, but then also to just create like an ongoing dialogue of people who are not just talking about ending the Federal Reserve, but doing the things that could actually do, uh, do that in one day or cause, you know, bring about a new monetary system. Um, but then, like I said, I, I'm not going to lose focus on, on where I see the problems really arising from. So, so we'll be talking a lot about, you know, uh, liberty and freedom and anarchism, voluntarism, unschooling, 
as well as many other topics, but never forgetting, you know, what we what we've been talking about here that it's 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 us that have the power to change those those problems that we perceive in the world. So Liberty Lifestyle will hopefully be a, a project that lasts many years, um, and it'll it'll develop over time and hopefully get more streamlined in the, with the editing process we were talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's it's just a podcast and and that's it really. It's not like a big network of multimedia or something. It's just mostly right now just going to be a podcast. Cool. Um, yeah, yeah. One thing that you um, oh, what did you mention? Um, uh, it'll 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 come to me later. Um, so um, okay, okay. So so in the meantime, please get into um, the uh, the Salt Lake Freedom Hive, and uh, and how that how that compares with that. Yeah. So the Salt Lake Freedom Hive, I started last October in twenty sixteen. No, August of twenty sixteen. Sorry. And that was more or less like um, me seeing that, okay, I came to all this understanding. I had all these glimpses of things that I found to be like true um, for myself and, and also something that I saw that were, was some universals and other things that could be used to change uh, society to be much, much better than it currently is. So, uh, you know, okay, a lot of anarchists I think are a little scared of working with other people or a lot of let's just say a lot of non-statists you know are, are scared to reach out and start working in their community it's kind of a fringe stance because you're surrounded by people with guns and other things that don't agree with you and uh, you know are willing to use violence against you for your uh, philosophy you know just like we saw with Ross Ulbrich you know um, the judge that threw him away for two life sentences said that it was his philosophy that was the most threatening not actually what he did and so, but we have, you know, a responsibility as human beings. We're not just individuals who can just be um, in our own little bubble and f- pretend that none of this stuff out here is affecting us. It absolutely is. And, and uh, everything is an interplay of each other. So, so the other people and the society around you and your family and, and the teachers and, and the bosses or the, the jobs that you're at, these are all very um, influential on you, but, but you can also be very influential on those systems as well. So um, reaching out to the community and working first, like we've been talking about, in your home, it starts with you and then your home and your family and maybe your extended family and friends you could start to, to work with and they can work with you and develop um, you know, a more free society, a, a more voluntary society over time. But then we have to take it out a level beyond that and reach out to our community. So the Salt Lake Freedom Hive was... First, me just putting ideas out on on paper in a blog that could be targeted to the local community. But uh, while I was researching that project, I kind of came across uh, Freedom Cells. I came across Derek Brose's work, um, Bob Podowski, um, his book Flourish, um, with his Octolog and Holomats um, approach to what we're calling Freedom Cells, which are decentralized uh, groups and a way to organize in a decentralized manner who work to bring about a voluntary society um, through the community. So, And they're also used as like a mutual aid, mutual benefit group for the members in it that are all seeing the problem with the state but that want still to have protection, you know. The big question, well, don't you want, who's going to protect us, you know? <laughs> and and <laughs> who's going to build the roads? Who's going to uh, do this and that, and we're like, well, uh, we are. Uh, we're on <laughs> cell four one one. Tyler, what do you what do you hate roads or something? Like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I, I personally love roads. I, you know, I I do. I love the grid. I love the the market. I have nothing against um, being protected. I have nothing against any of those things. I have I have a problem with violence, and I have a problem with predatory um, systems of control around us that demand me to participate when I may choose not to and then threaten me at the point of a gun in a cage to comply, right? Mm-hmm. So though they're the violent ones <laughs> and me, me not liking the roads, even if I hated the roads, <laughs> would still not be, uh, it would not legitimize taxation whatsoever, right? <laughs> no. Because um, we don't need roads. Eventually we'll be in our spaceships flying <laughs> around and say uh, oh you don't i have to pay property tax over here okay i'm just going to go over here you know <laughs> right and and they won't need roads eventually <laughs> but even then people will build the structure people 
will create the infrastructure. People have always built those infrastructures, and so they still do. There's not some magical person named government that creates roads, right? It's it's usually companies that aren't even part of the government. They're just contracting with them, and uh, it's always been people, and it'll always still be a, be people. And in in a nonviolent society, people will still need to travel. So. <laughs> It'll still work out. But now, now I forget where I was going with that. So give me oh, back. On. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, well, let me just say I remember what I was going to say, but I also want to say an additional thing, which was um, the value of what you and I are doing as podcasters and content creators is powerful, and I think a lot of people tend to underestimate that you know they're like what are you doing you're just making videos and you're just making pot like well, like well, what, what is your goal what do you expect to do with all this and to me the goal is to spread ideas powerful ideas to influence the conversation right to generate thought and uh, debate and you know that's how we achieve progress is by challenging the status quo right always trying to make something better build something more efficient um and i think uh our our conversations and and podcasts with our the various um guests that we have on demonstrate that that's possible that we can have a better world and we don't need the violence of the state right the guns of government are entirely unnecessary and counterproductive so um, yeah, sp the idea of spreading knowledge, spreading, um, spreading concepts is very much underestimated. And, you know, if you think about like wars, like like you know, you, you ask somebody, why do wars happen? And they're like, well, this country declared war in this country. All right, you can look at it that way, but you can also say it's just an idea. Statism, it's an idea. It's an idea that my piece of dirt is better than your piece of dirt, and I'm willing to kill you for that. It's an idea. Right, and so you change the ideas, and all of a sudden, you know, massive shifts in uh, in understanding and comprehension occur. And so it's very important that um, ideas are not belittled and uh, downgraded. So that's the first thing. And the other thing I wanted to say is, um, you mentioned how people you, like like you don't just want to talk about. Um, these things and and um, you know talk about how a voluntary society could be good. You want to actually start making it. <laughs> you want to you want to demonstrate right. to people that this is a real thing. You can live this way, right? And it's not just an intellectual exercise. Um, yeah. And that's a very important concept um, because I think it's so much more powerful that we don't just say how horrible the Federal Reserve is or you know how horrible the Board of Education is. We just all we have to do is can is just be prosperous and thrive uh, in spite of it, right? Engage in agorist activities, um, avoid taxation as, as much as possible, avoid transactions in, in the eyes of the state as much as possible, um, educate your kids outside of the government schooling. You know that's how you really topple an empire, not with guns, not with violence, not with assassinations, <laughs> by more and more yeah. people just withdrawing their participation and their support so yeah kudos for that absolutely absolutely no and and that's what both of those projects are all about like you said i mean it's powerful to be able to put a concept out that you've taken the time to vet because we're not just spitting out garbage into the youtube atmosphere that we're just coming up with on the random whim walking down the so, road you know so, so tyler how many cat videos can i expect to see on your youtube channel <laughs> <laughs> Well, my personal one, or no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, but and and so that's what the Salt Lake Freedom Hive is absolutely all about: is is using apps like Cell Four One One or Nextdoor.com, which are decentralized apps and ways of communi uh, communicating with your friends and neighbors and community that doesn't need the state. So when people say to me, "Who's going to protect us from the bad guys?" I say. Download Cell 411. I'll protect you if you call me. I'll come help you and defuse the situation if we can plan it out and, and discuss how that'll work. Then there's apps, and, and I'll, I'll do it. And we have our Freedom Cell that, that we all have the Cell 411 app downloaded. And I test it out sometimes. I jump on and, and do a quick test of the system, right? Like, a, this is just a test of the broadcast system. And um, it works, you know? If, if I, The other day, I ran out of gas on the freeway. 
luckily enough, I was I was really close to the gas station, so I just walked down the street. But I could see that as being one of the an example of, hey, I don't want to call an authority. I don't even really want to call a tow truck driver here. Hey, but Joe in my freedom cell, we plan for these kind of situations. Here's a somewhat of an emergency here. Hmm. Let's test this system out and see if it works and, and start to create that culture of liberty, you know, now. You know, there's no reason to wait because hmm. it, there's the, the technology is available to us. There are people in, in each especially if you're near a major city, I think you can reach out and network with the people that are like-minded at this point and and start to feel a lot more comfortable too with, I think a lot of people who start to oppose statism start to feel very rejected and ousted and like hermetic, like they're just put off over here in, in the box of what everybody else considers to be kind of loony. Mm. But, but, you know, use the technology to reach out to your community. Use these these apps that I just mentioned, those two, or go on freedomcells.com or any of the other platforms. There's there's tons of platforms out there that kind of have the same philosophy as this decentralized way of organizing. And and yeah, that's what the Salt Lake Freedom Hive is, is developing into at this point. We're, we're very active and getting you know, permaculture groups we meet up with. We support them. Um, we're doing a plant exchange here next weekend, followed up by... In June, we're going to be doing a crypto digital currencies uh, training Skillshare hmm. because, you know, the way the Freedom Cell works is is you get a small group of people, eight to ten people, is is what the science or the research has shown is more effective for this kind of a thing. Um, some people say fifty percent male, fifty percent female. You know, if you can strike that balance, and then the group comes to a consensus only on what they're going to work on moving forward. So. It's very small, very focused, and then people can, you know, not feel like they're getting voted out or whatever. We all have to agree. And the thing that people kind of really interested in is skill sharing. So we've all decided let's start hosting skill shares. Let's start. We'll do the organizing, and then we'll invite the community in. So when they say, "Well, who do you? What are you going to replace the Fed with?" We are having a digital currency skill share on cryptocurrency, on on Bitcoin, on Dash, on Litecoin, in not one specific coin. And ultimately, I don't see Bitcoin or crypto being the ultimate solution to all of, of humanity's problems or even to the economic system. Because again, the, the, the solution is compassion, uh, love, and caring, and um, approaching people as if they are in need of healing, because they are. Anyone who's supporting the state especially now in the time that we live in because we don't really have as many excuses as people before who just maybe they were completely sealed off from all the information mm. completely nescient of mm. any other philosophy and then literally like beaten into a certain way of acting well it's very hands off now at least our our slavery is remote control right and and the remote control that they have is very powerful it's, it's a full spectrum dominance coming your way. Um, they have every level of the spectrum dominated. And so part of, like you were saying, putting out this powerful information is to at least attempt to, th to, to thwart, to push back a little bit on the complete media manipulation, psyop, you know, government controlled, uh, drug agency controlled, big pharma controlled, media that, that pumps out 24-7. They don't stop, right? They don't ever hit the brakes. They're on 24-7 pumping their message. So if you think you can just sit back and say, hey, I don't want anything to do with this place. I'm going to go live out in the woods. I'm going to go check out and move to Mexico. I'm going to move to Puerto Rico and get away from this. You're not getting away from anything. They're not going to leave you alone. They're not going to stop. They're, can, they're going after those people that are out there trying to just be left alone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so absolutely, I, I agree with you there that, that this isn't just a hobby just for play, that it, that it, that it can be a powerful message to, to reach people on these platforms and that we, we are the new media, you know, we are the people who need to be doing the work, not just you and I, though. Any, anyone who feels like they can contribute to this, to pushing humanity out of this... Uh, condition that it's in of mind control and complete dominance and slavery needs to 
step up and start doing that work. It's not just an option. It, it's a requirement. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, um, so please get into your approach to peaceful parenting. And um, if, that's, uh, if that has changed like before you became a parent or after you became a parent. Well, so I, um, like I said, I looked into Skylar J. Collins quite a bit before I even became a parent. So I was looking into the work, actually preparing myself um, to become a parent because I wanted a family. I wanted to start a family. I wanted to have kids. You know, I um, want to, um, ha I wanted to have that in my life. But I, I recognized at that point when I was doing that, uh, starting to look into like voluntarism and peaceful parenting and unschooling, I wasn't a parent at that time, but I saw in myself that, 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 that I could have issues with, with trying these things out. So I wanted to start working on, on myself earlier to be prepared to, um, be a peaceful parent to unschool because I would never subject my kid to, to public school for sure. And even private schools are a little sketchy with, uh, you know, they still get the communist core teachers in there. Mm. They're certified by the same kind of people. Yeah. Um, they themselves kind of pushing statism, right? They don't necessarily probably give the voice uh, to the other options out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, so when I actually uh, met my wife, Cassandra, she had a son already. So I got, I, I was luckily enough, prepared enough, you know, uh, with my own healing and stuff to start to practice these principles in real time. Um, she had a four-year-old son when I met her, and I told her, you know, all about kind of myself and where I came from and that I would never, you know, want to send my kid to, to, to a state-ran institution and that uh, the peaceful parenting and, and non-schooling that, um, you know, to me, I hope peaceful parenting becomes a term that's no longer necessary someday, mm -hmm. you right. know, right. because it is wrong to hit your child, and it, it is wrong to treat them like you own them uh, and that you can just do whatever you want. And if you don't give them the respect of the non-aggression principle, that's worse than not giving it to other people because they're in your home involuntarily mm -hmm. for the most part. They're not really there by choice um, where you kind of are. They're there almost without choice. Well, basically without choice at all. So mm -hmm. it's even more important to, to give them that respect to it. Uh, treat them as a sovereign individual who um, has the right to exist in their body without being harmed. And spanking is harm. You know, I've had this argument with people, surprisingly. They didn't see spanking as a form of harm. They saw it as what they said, the only way, you know, the only way to properly teach a child. And they even gave examples of how there was no other way in this certain scenario to not spank my kid to teach him afterward. And I was like, really? There's no other way, right? Well, yeah, they just don't have the logic. They just don't have the reason. Well, there you go. <laughs> There's the parenting. Right. <laughs> right. That's your opportunity. That's where, that's, that, that, that's be, where, that's where you come in. <laughs> it's not going to be a 10-minute conversation. It takes years to get them thinking critically, to get them reasoning properly, to get them to understand why they shouldn't have ran out in front of that car. Right. But what hitting does is it's the easy way out. It's the easy way for the parent to teach a quick lesson to a programmable human being that will learn through pain mm -hmm. about not doing a certain behavior. So yeah, it works. It's effective, but it's also traumatizing. Mm -hmm. It's the cycle we were talking about earlier. There's the continuing of that cycle. Mm -hmm. And then when they get older, they're going to feel like it's okay to do the same thing to their children mm -hmm. and to other human beings. Mm -hmm. And the other human beings can do that to them and it's okay. That's where that exception for statism comes. Because, oh no, you shouldn't hit Johnny. Don't hit Sally. But if dad hits you, it's okay. <laughs> right. I hit you. The teacher hits you. It's okay. <laughs> right? And then the exception for authority to abuse you physically is is created. So if you don't, that's why I, I completely disagree with <laughs> with even the slightest spanking mm. as being necessary. It's not necessary. It's only necessary if you want to teach that child to be subservient subservient to any ath external authority over them, even if they're using violence on them. You know, and it is violence. Spanking is violence. So it's not necessarily that I 
have to label myself a peaceful parent. I'm just a nonviolent person. <laughs> I like that. that you said, uh, why do we even have to use that term? So it's like, it's like what do you support? Violent parenting? <laughs> right? It's a it's like very uh, strange thing. And that's actually a wonderful way to um, describe volunteerism and anarchism is, um, you know, I, I like, you know, when I explain to people what I do, I just say, um, I, I, I talk about volunteerism. They say, what's that? I say, oh, it's just a voluntary interaction between peaceful people. Do, do you like that? Yeah, good, cool. <laughs> How could you not, <laughs> you know? Um, or or um, or the way Bill, Bill Bupert would ask people, he's like, uh, when he says, I'm an abolitionist, <clears throat> and, and he says, I, uh, I oppose all slavery. What, what kind of slavery do you support? <laughs> Right. You, know, you know, so so it's, That's all, I like the terms, you know, the terms are good at getting the conversation going. Like I was starting this with with the whole road to volunteerism, road to anarchism. Mm. Those are terms to be able to bring it up. And I think we should use terms like slavery mm -hmm. to dis to describe the conditions that most people are in. And, uh, you know, peaceful parenting or like you said, that's funny, like do you support the violent parenting? Like maybe we <laughs> start calling it that because it's much more clear. And then they're on the defense, you know, right. and calling, like you said earlier, you mentioned that even supporting and advocating for government is supporting and advocating for violence. Right. And if, if you can get somebody in that conversation, now they're on the defense for being violent mm -hmm. instead of the roads and how are you going to protect everybody? Get them on the defense for being a violent supporter of murder. You know, because they're, they're, what they're doing is killing people with their ideology. And, and that's literally true. The biggest killers of people, and if you just look at the 20th century alone, mm -hmm. was government and democide mm -hmm. and, and medical abuse through withholding the information that people need to heal themselves. And it's actively being done. And what they're doing to the, to the children with these vaccines is also an attack on their biology on their immune system and the evidence is out there you can remain ignorant of it if you'd like but that is also advocating for murder of mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. and so if you want to defend against that let's have a conversation but but to talk about these other things as what we need to bring the discussion on you know um, how would we pay for this how are you going to do that um, <laughs> right <laughs> non non-violently that's how, how I always answer <laughs> I'm going to do it using systems of non-predatory uh, ways of being, you know. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They're just, they're really deflections uh, away from the um, the idea that basically taxation is theft, which most people would not want to admit. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, talking about volunteerism, that's just a, a wonderful way, I find, to introduce all kinds of aspects of, of agorism and peaceful parenting um, and uh, homeschooling, unschooling, all that kind of stuff, because um, y y you just say, you know, if you advocate for voluntary interactions, and I think, what, what, um, what kind of relationships in your life do you appreciate? It's the voluntary ones. <laughs> what do you not appreciate? Um, and and you know, most of the time it has to do with the state taxation, right? And, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, tax tax month, right? And then. And then schooling, nobody, very few people say, yeah, I love my schooling. <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> they force me to learn all kinds of useless crap. <laughs> yeah, no, the monetary system is a good place to start with people. That's another one, yeah. Um, you know, and I think you do a beautiful job with that, um, especially, and I think some of the, the reading that you've done in the past and the study and research you've done helps you on that angle. And it's a good angle to get to get started with people, but it should it shouldn't end there. And there's more to the problem than just the economy, but but it's a great starter because if you can explain how the Federal Reserve System works, most people would, oh, no, I don't want that. That's horrible. That's predatory. Mm -hmm. These people are doing what? You know, 30% of my energy a year goes to who? Mm. And to people you've never met, and they're not on the ballot, that's for sure, <laughs> you know, and they're not going to be. And they, can, they are putting the people on the ballot in front of you that you're voting for. And, uh, you know, so it's a good starter for sure. I think economics and like you said voluntarism as opposed maybe to using anarchism depending mm. on your crowd right um yeah. it's a it's a much more diffused word that and, well yeah i'm voluntary i'm non-violent i don't want to be violent right. and then if you can slowly kind of ease in well you're supporting violence yeah. you know th uh but what about this yeah, <laughs> you know yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Economics is a definitely a wonderful, um, non-threatening conversation to have with people. Um, you know, just talking about you know, like uh, I think I mentioned Mike Maloney, right? The Hidden Secrets of Money with you on my uh, the other the last time we talked. Um, awesome, awesome content. You know, just talking about you know what's the difference between currency and money, right? What why why were precious metals? What why were they in in uh, in use before and they are no longer in use today, right? And what does the Federal Reserve have to do with that, right? And what is inflation, right? Simple concepts that get people thinking, and uh, and they don't have to get angry about it. They don't have to get, um, you know, uh, just um, belligerent because these are facts. These are <laughs> this is what we live with, um, and this is the reality. Is you know, the Federal Reserve is a monopoly on currency, but um, and then once you understand it, you can um, begin to improve your life. You can organize your life in a better way because you know. I think I think most people understand like about inflation, like you know, the money money de- uh, decreases in value. Although they don't tend to see it like that. They tend to see it as prices are constantly increasing, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and so they're like, yeah, I got to make more and more money. You got to invest. But but I'm saying, but then you know, you know, when you tell people, you know, like um, what is it like like two cents. Um, no, it's like a dollar today is worth two cents, like in 1913, right? That's, that's basically the devaluation. It's like almost dead. <laughs> yeah. Um, and of course there's other examples of hyperinflation all around the world that you can point to, right? Peru and Venezuela and Colombia and Weimar Republic. I love talking about that. The Zimbabwe hyperinflation was in 2011, you know, wonderful, wonderful education opportunities to discuss with people uh, about, what happens, you know, when um, the currency supply is hijacked by a central bank and what essentially is happening is counterfeiting, although we tend to use these euphemisms like quantitative easing, currency creation, uh, increasing the money supply. Well, even <laughs> even inflation, you know, I didn't really think about this, but my buddy brought up to me the other day. He's like, even the word inflation is, is kind of confusing. They should call it deflation. And like you, or the word you just used, devaluation right. is a much better term because mm. inflation almost sounds like, oh, it's just getting bigger. You know, it's, it's more. <laughs> right. And and the people, it's just like the Federal Reserve System. They've right. used the same trickery there. It's yeah. not federal. It's yeah. not. They don't have any reserves. Mm. And the whole system was the word that system word was put in to make people feel like there was checks and balances. You know, it's a system. Mm. But just go back and look at Alan Greenspan saying on you know some live television interview that no one you know makes any decisions that the federal reserve can't decide something different and and they they can't tell them what to do right he right. says we operate completely independent <laughs> of any yeah. government right, right right and um yeah that that's it's not federal it's not they don't have reserves especially now and yeah. uh it's not really a, a good system yeah. um but they use words like inflation to take away from what it really is theft you know um, slavery, mm-hmm. uh, usury, uh, predat- being they're predatory. Mm-hmm. That, that's what it is, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, yeah. There's a great book that I, I read. Um, I think it's called um, something like how they control, like why why currency is toxic and how they control you with it. Something like that by this guy McDonald and another guy. And uh, fascinating, fascinating book. And one thing I gleaned from that book was how you look at a dollar bill, and that in itself is a wonderful educational tool. And I have used that many times when I was in my working in my acupuncture clinic, and I would, uh, you know, find a patient that I I kind of vetted each of the patients, and and I would see okay, which person is a critical thinker and would be open to these ideas. And once I found someone, then I would go in the room, take out my dollar bill, and just go through. You know, it says Federal Reserve note. What does that mean? Right? We call this a dollar bill. But why does it say Federal Reserve note, right? So then that's a good explain what the Federal Reserve basically, and then why do they call it note, right? It's a contract. It's an IOU, <laughs> right? It's debt. it's debt, exactly, right? And then and then what what is this but a piece of paper with ink on it, right? So how much do you think it costs to print and transport this, right? <laughs> and I ask them, how much do you think? And, and and I tell them six about six cents, right? And how much do you think it, it costs to print and transport a hundred dollar bill? <laughs> and I'm like seven cents because you got extra zeros, you got a little more ink. 
<laughs> and then their eyes like open up. <gasps> what? <laughs> really? <laughs> that's what I'm. That's what I'm like working so hard for. <laughs> um, and, and 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 you know just. Um, yeah, just and, and I remember Mike Maloney. One of his uh, one of his documentaries. He was saying, how oh, he, he goes travels these different countries, and he would see, you know, the machines that they print the money and it's just just go a mile a minute, a mile a minute, right? And and it's like people work to death for that, and these politicians just printing, 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 and they get just, you know, of course they get first dibs and they can spend on whatever they want, right? Because <laughs> they're the politicians, and whereas the people are like um, slaving away. Uh, for that and uh, and so yeah and so then the, then the, then the question becomes okay so if I know there's inflation and I know my my money's being devalued my currency's being devalued where do I put my wealth and that's the, that's the real question how do you protect yourself right everybody wants to know that and so then you got to go into the uh, then I go into the whole history of precious metals and and uh, and artificial versus um, you know artificial currency versus um, natural currency or forced currency and state currency different things like that and then why is gold and silver um, why have they been hailed king as money, as the ultimate pres- preserver of value? Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah, and I think I, I kind of want to know why. I mean, I I think money itself is, is another belief system. It's something that we've taken without question and just accepted as truth without looking into it more thoroughly. And uh, there's nothing wrong with it as a tool for no. human beings to interact with each other with. But still... It's only a belief system that gives it any value. The true value is in human beings. Mm-hmm. It, human right. beings' infinite potential is what the value, um, that's where value is derived, where, where it is held, where it is stored, is in human beings. Now, right. if we decide to interact and trade with different seashells or gold or coconuts, you know, which would be very inconvenient, then that's all fine. But, uh, you know, you take the predatory aspects out of that trade, and there, there's nothing wrong with it, but you still have to see it as a belief system. You know, I had this conversation with a few friends the other day, and when I first heard this, this said this way too, it was like a belief system. Like, what do you mean? You know, well, there's no intrinsic value in paper mm-hmm. for sure, um, unless you can eat it. Uh, maybe there's some papers out there you could you can eat and make into clothes and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But but gold itself, um, there's no intrinsic value as in if you're the every you know the worst stfh shit hit the fan right, right. scenario happens um can you bathe and, and can you eat right. gold exactly can you yeah. can you shelter yourself with it I mean, maybe <laughs> if you had a whole lot of it can you drink it right. can you breathe it right. <laughs> does it help you raise children well you know if you can use it to trade other things but intrinsically right. in, inherently it's not valuable exactly it, it, it can transport wealth and people have you know speculated that it's because it can last under water for millions of years in the ocean and you pull it up and it's just like the the day that it went down mm. well that that's a good value and and today we use it in electronics gold gets used mm. on motherboards to mm. to be um um used in the technology industry so it's intrinsically valuable there maybe but you still can't eat it still can't drink it still can't use it to really live with the basic things you need so gold is still a belief system precious metals still just our belief that makes it valuable in reality because we are the ones that are valuable. But at that same time, I have no problem with, with using paper or using gold to trade with other people. Um, but it's the predatory aspect of the Federal Reserve that, or any banking system which seeks to you know create something from nothing and then charge massive amounts of interest and you know, manipulate wars and loan money to governments to go to war that they themselves manipulated. That's obviously all things that I don't agree with. So, yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great distinction. And that's one that we as volunteers have to frequently make with status, which is um, it's uh, from the, uh, the Frederick Bastiat uh, quote from the 19th century. Um, when, when we object to something being done by the state, socialists believe that we object to it being done at all. <laughs> right? right? So if, so as, as, and, and his, um, his example is, you know, if we object, object to grain being subsidized by the state, that then they conclude that we object to people eating <laughs> grain. <laughs> right. Right? So It's the same with when you advocate for no state. People think you're advocating for no rules, but it's not yeah. no rules. It's no rulers. There are still rules. Right. And, you know, 
know, in, those rules are the natural law. The, the rules are the laws that govern human behavior that are existent here in this reality. And we can come to understand those things. And I, I'm not, you know, um, I don't know if you're like into natural law or if you feel like there's some uh, construct of laws that govern human morality. Um, but, you know, I see it that way. And we're not advocating for no rules. Mm -hmm. It's no rulers, and I that's a, bi a big one. And it, for anarchists, you might be, yeah, of course. Well, not the statists. When you start talking, no rulers, they picture in their head just yeah. fireballs <laughs> flying across the sky and murderers <laughs> dropping off with your wife on a motorcycle, and you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and you're like, yeah, that's an excellent way to raise my kids. Exactly, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> But there are still rules, and and if exactly. humans to be truly free, they will learn those rules and they will live by them because there's the law of freedom in in the in a set of laws known as natural law, and it goes like this: that the more moral that a human species is, or the more moral we are in the aggregate, the more freedom we will ultimately experience because. You know, the more you're, we're taking away someone's natural rights from them, the more that we're impeding on their right to be without being harmed. If we're all doing that, that's going to create a whole system of slavery. But if we all live according to the non-aggression principle, the principle of self-ownership, try to raise our kids peacefully, try to have uh, peaceful interactions with other human beings, that will ultimately result in much more freedom because of this natural law. Because when you... Uh, live that way in the vast overwhelming majority of people freedom will ultimately continue to grow and grow and grow because the more moral a society is it's it's directly linked to how free a society is exactly beautifully said you know um it's too much fun talking with another volunteer as tyler man we can talk for hours <laughs> yeah let me let me i do i do want to fit in at one of the other things you had me prepare here with some books Unless you had something else that I no, wanted to go into. I want to kind of reference ahead. a few things here. Sure, sure, go ahead. That's cool. I won't go on through my... I, I did make a list, so sure. just in case I left something out. But then when you make a list, you always leave something out. <laughs> but one, <laughs> one book, just to kind of get people's attention drawn to it if they haven't heard of it, is The End of All Evil hmm. by Jeremy Locke. And it's a PDF you can find out there online. You, you probably won't be able to find a physical copy until somebody picks up the task of of publishing this again and getting it back out there. But I'd like to read a little quote from that book actually here that I had written down. And and when he's talking about evil here, he's talking about anything that opposes that infinite worth of the human being. So anything that takes away from that value hmm. is what he's defining as evil. So it's not some Christian conjuring that you should have up in your head about a satanic hmm. evil thing. He's talking about Freedom is freedom. Anything that opposes that is evil. Mm. And here he says, To understand how evil controls people, it is necessary to understand the difference between principle and law. A principle is a truth that creates freedom, and a law is a lie that creates slavery. Principles describe reality. They are knowledge that help you make use of our world. Because of your intelligence, you recognize principle in everything you do. Every true thing you learn is a principle. The movement of your hands, which food tastes good, mathematics, and empathy for a friend are all based on principle. Laws are artificial ideas created by evil men to restrict the thinking and understanding of people. Laws mask themselves in authority so that they can impersonate principle. When people mistake truth for the ideas of authority, their abilities and wisdom are, dim are diminished. This is the purpose of law. Law must be enforced because there is no truth in it. A law destroys freedom because it is a lie. A principle, however, creates freedom because it is knowledge. That which destroys freedom is evil. And that's from the the book The End of All Evil by Jeremy Locke, which which really just kind of it was one of the the great books that I read, uh, and I still go back to and listen to uh, podcasts and stuff where they talk about it. Hmm. Uh, it's a really good book. Have you have you checked that out? Never heard of it. No, sounds good though. <laughs> sounds awesome. <laughs> 
Yeah, I'll send you a, a copy. Yeah. The and, 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 and by the way, I, yeah, I don't know if uh, I guess we skipped over that, but any any books that you would recommend uh, or that you have read um, that you found uh, value from? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, that one, and then The Stellar Man by John Baines is another one people might not have heard of. That's more like hermetic philosophy, mm. which I'm not like a secret practicing hermeticist or something, but <laughs> there is a lot of good stuff on natural law in hermeticism. Cool. Um, the Ky- Kybalion, same thing. I'm not a religious Kybalion guru, <laughs> but, but the seven hermetic principles as described in the book, The Kybalion, mm. are really good to, to help us understand our reality and how natural law works. Um, Astro Theology and Shamanism by Jan Irvin and Andrew Rudigi, um was a book that helped me really get into symbolism and start to break down a lot of the, the more esoteric stuff in religion. Hmm. And then uh, Astro Theology, how the, how the Bible and uh, the Christian mythology is really uh, heavily based in that, as well as a lot of other religions. Um, one that I know you've read, The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose, hmm. and along with that, like Freedom by Adam Kokesh. Um, Larkin Rose's The Most Dangerous Superstition is almost like a hidden natural law book because he really just, the way he explains authority and the belief in it and what that manifests, I I think is really kind of describing how natural law works. And then Frederick Bastier, The Law, I mean, you brought him up. I know you've read a lot of his work. Mm. That one in particular is good. John Taylor Gatto, Dumbing Us Down, Weapons of Mass Destruction, or The Underground History of American Education. That he, His writing is tremendous. It's not just the content, but the way he presented it and, and who he is. It's just mm. really good story. You know, and the, the Deliberate Dumbing Down of America by Charlotte Iserby, mm. another one along those lines. That's a hard book to get through because <laughs> hmm. it's like chronological. Oh. So she like goes through each year and what uh, happened as far as like the dumbing down of America. Um, another one, Lysander Spooner, No Treason, The Constitution of No Authority. Mm-hmm. That's a great book. Oh, yeah. Um, it show, it'll prove to you <laughs> logically and reasonably why the Constitution is illegitimate and doesn't apply to you. It doesn't apply to anyone who's around today, you know, and it's just another just belief system, right? Mm. Uh, Thomas Paine, Common Sense and the Rights of Man, just tremendous books. That man was writing, you know, with fire. He... He had it in his heart and lived freedom to, to the fullest extent that he could and was a big catalyst for the American Revolution and the French, French Revolution. And I, from my research, the true author of the De- Declaration of Independence was Thomas Paine. Hmm. And um, regardless of what you think about the Founding Fathers, hmm. which is kind of sounds religious almost, <laughs> um, the founders of this country, I think he was the most enlightened of them Mm. and if you look at his works and his life um you know he he didn't hold slaves and didn't think that it was kind of okay after and didn't he didn't go back on the constitution after or sorry the declaration after it was written like thomas jefferson kind of did in his writings kind of he started to oh maybe this was a mistake you know Mm -hmm. and somebody who wrote a document like that wouldn't falter right later on they would that would have been in their blood, and so read Thomas Paine's work, and I think you can start to see where I'm coming from. Um, the Anatomy of Human Destructiveness by Eric Fromm that'll really help to start to understand this problem of it being a, a problem going on within people and not necessarily just out here. Um, the Trivium, there's a couple books out there, but The Trivium, specifically by Sister Miriam Joseph is a good book. She comes at it from a little bit more of a Christian slant, but still the Trivium Method. I'm a student of the Trivium. Try to practice the Trivium Method, uh, grammar, logic, and rhetoric. And if you've not heard of that, that's something that that you can get into with that book um, pretty deep. Also, TriviumEducation.com by Jan Urban would be a good one. And then the works of Anthony C. Sutton also. Um, I got into this guy's work, and it's more like scholarly writings that are like made for like PhD-level graduates, um, the American secret establishment, how the order controls education, Wall Street and the rise of Hitler, and one that I haven't read yet, Wall Street and the rise of the Bolshevik uh, revolution. Um, He really kind of gives a whole other side of how World War I, World War II went down, and um, how 
Skull and Bones has has affected American society and how they've kind of infiltrated every aspect of of the political structure. Um, James Perloff has wrote a couple books, the, Sh- the Shadows of Power and Truth is a Lonely Warrior. These are both great books, too. Um, the Shadows of Power goes into the Council on Foreign Relations. That's really interesting. Um, and Mass Control. This book is really good as well, kind of like The Anatomy of Human Destructiveness by Eric Fromm, but more of like <laughs> this like remote control um, engineering that's going on. It's not any more like chains and whip slavery, right? We have a, more of a mind control, mm-hmm. um, complete domination of that, like full spectrum dominance, like I was saying earlier, um, by Jim Keith. That's a, that's a great book. And then finally, I know I'm kind of going on here. <laughs> <That's all right. laughs> Another one that I really like is The Wisdom of Your Cells by Bruce Lipton. Mm-hmm. And that book blew my mind. It, it really goes into healing this problem and how to do it. Not, not even just talking about how, like healing, oh, we need to meditate and just change our mind and everything will be great. Um, he actually goes into like the biology of, of epigenetics and genetics and how you're not just uh, predestined to be uh, what your parents were or your grandparents based on, on genes or a certain construct that you're just going to have these problems. Mm. And it's, it's very much more based on the epigenetic environment around you. Um, and then I have some some podcasts and, and other people that have really um, helped me along the way, like uh, Gnostic Media, Jan Urban from the Gnostic Media podcast, um, and his site, like I said, TriviumEducation.com, monumental work. Um, he opposes the, the alternative media a lot of the time, even with his work. And, you know, he's exposed people like Terrence McKenna and the whole psychedelic revolution as being a lot, largely a MK Ultra operation towards the end, especially. Hmm, really? um, yeah, you'd have to look into his work. Richard Grove from Tragedy and Hope, Peace Revolution podcast, 9-11 Synchronicity, um, great podcast to go through. James Corbett, The Corbett Report, excellent work for coming from him. Mm-hmm. Um, Mark Passio has been a big influence for me from what on earth is happening.com. Um, his work on natural law is just key, regardless of if you don't agree with everything Mark says, at least check out the Natural Law Seminar. Um, Manly P. Hall, David Ike, Michael Tessarion, Jordan Maxwell, um, Ernest Hancock from Declare Your Independence. He's a great liberty guy. And uh, check, check out his little stitcher or um, his archive or go listen to Declare Your Independence by Ernest Hancock. It's really kind of an upbeat take on, on what's going on. Um, the movie Thrive a great documentary that changed my life. Mm. Um, and this guy, I kind of want to give a little second here is Lennon honor and Lennon honor is, uh, he's a father and a researcher and, and puts out his own content. He had a podcast called the visions of manhood and it's kind of hard to find, but if you can find the visions of manhood podcast, especially you younger guys out there, <laughs> um, it really affected me. And this guy, he just, he just comes from a place of, he, he, it was almost like the person who really finally raised me. Hmm. You know, I wasn't fully raised, and I came across the Vision of Man, Manhood podcast, and uh, the way Lennon talks about, you know, it's definitely more of a man-type podcast, but he's a man, and he's talking about the problem from that angle, and, and starting in the home with your children, but hmm. being a, a real adult first before you try to do that, if possible, hopefully. And then uh, the last guest on the Liberty Lifestyle podcast has the Free Your Mind podcast. And that, that's a great eclectic work of guests that he's brought on to um, free your mind, really. I mean, go through that and sh- uh, strap in. That's all I got to say. <laughs> <sighs> awesome. Awesome. So um, please uh, reiterate how people can reach you if they want to follow your work. Yeah, well, we already mentioned, you know, TylerBoyer.com. Um, I'll be revamping that right now. It redirects to my podcast, but that'll have all my various links in there. Um, Salt Lake Freedom Hive. Find me on Facebook, Twitter, um, Patreon. A dollar a month would be great if you'd like to support what I'm doing. And Steam it. I love posting to Steam it because I really like that that form of blockchain technology. It's a really cool social media platform. And also, one thing we didn't mention here was uh, WithinTheStones.com, and that's another podcast I did, and there's there's four key episodes in there currently, and I will go back and retouch on that. But uh, we talk about psychopathy, um, social engineering, 
eugenics, and then natural law. And so I really, I really think that there's about like 14 hours there of episode in those four episodes that if people want to go through and check that out, they can too. Awesome. Beautiful. Yes, please support uh, Tyler. He's doing some awesome work. He's, uh, he's just coming onto the podcasting scene, but you know, the more voices for liberty, the better. Um, so, yeah, you can support me also on Patreon, um, patreon.com slash Um also through PayPal or my Bitcoin. Um, you know, if you enjoy what I do and interviewing fascinating people like Tyler here, um, please uh, give me some monetary support. Some uh, compensation is always appreciated as we are capitalists in the end and we respond to incentives. So, um, you know, we offer this for free, but... Um, you know, our time is not free, right? Because we're always choosing to do something else that we could not do. Um, it's the uh, opportunity cost, right? <laughs> so if you enjoy this work, please support me. You know, a dollar a day is, is all I ask or a dollar uh, per episode. Um, and uh, you can uh, help me do what I do uh, do best, which is uh, advocating for volunteerism and peace and love. <laughs> I think that's, a, that's the true, true message we're advocating. So for Tyler... Sure. Awesome uh, co- uh, conversation. Thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. So this is um, yeah, thank Anarch- you. No problem. So this is peaceful anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and theseedsofliberty dot com and theconsciousresistance dot com. Wishing all of you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye. Yeah. Thank. Thank you, Danilo. Take care. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government-controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so-called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.